introduce Jim Mayer. Uh, Jim, right here to my right, uh, my right, your left, uh, is president and CEO of California Forward, a bipartisan public interest effort to bolster dem democracy and improve the performance of government in California. Uh, Jim was part of the team that developed and launched California Forward in 2008. Prior to that, Jim was executive director of the Little Hoover Commission in Sacramento, an independent, oh, that, there we go, <laughs> an independent and bipartisan state panel that reviews state programs and policies for efficiency and effectiveness. He also served as a journalist for 10 years with the Sacramento Bee, as well as the Bakersfield Californian. Here in, a little bit closer to home in Yolo County, Jim serves on the board of the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, and is also a director on the Yolo County Resources Conservation District. He and his wife, Andrea, also own an olive orchard and make award-winning olive under the Frate Sole label. Jim Mayer, good evening. Welcome. Good evening, everybody. We're awful glad you're here. Uh, this is really one in a series of, uh, of a great civic effort here that we should all be very proud that we're part of, and we're grateful to the leadership for convening occasionally around important topics, and nothing at the moment uh, uh, seems to rise to the occasion about how we're going to provide water to our community in the state of California in coming years. Uh, we're going to, what we're, the plan for tonight is we've got really a terrific group of speakers, and we've asked them all uh, to do something very torturous, which is to keep their opening remarks to five or seven minutes uh, so that over the, over the course of walking down the table here, we'll get a nice arc of, of both California and statewide perspectives, short-term, long-term, and hopefully very long-term in terms of sustainability. And that will enable us to have a lot of time for you to ask the questions that are most important to you because you are all reading about these issues and the conditions and we want to make sure that we're filling in your knowledge gap. So you do have a card or your neighbor has a card and you'll retch it out of their hands because there's a shortage of everything. And uh, feel free to write down your questions and either Susan or Petraea will pick them up. So if, if you, when you fill them up, pass them down the line and let the person on the end of the row hand them to Susan. And that way we will uh, efficiently try to cue those up. I'm going to quickly, very quickly, introduce this esteemed panel, uh, and we're going to move right down from my right, your left, uh, and then each of them will, will take a few minutes uh, to share their kind of opening comments on this important issue. Uh, the first person all the way down on uh, my far right, your left, is David Guy, who's the president of the Northern California Water Association. And again, we're incredibly lucky to have David in the Sacramento Valley, and we're incredibly lucky to have him here tonight. Uh, David's been the president of NACWA since uh, J June of 2010. Before that, he spent three years uh, in Yosemite as the chief executive officer of the Yosemite Association. And before that, he was the president and CEO of NACWA. So if you're tracking this, he, he ran NACWA. He must have thought he solved the water problems. He went to live gloriously in Yosemite and after three years got bored with Yosemite and moved back to the Sacramento Valley in order to help us manage uh, and, and really leave a good water legacy. So we're grateful for David and David being here tonight, and he's going to give us a, a kind of a nice Northern California perspective on things. Um, sitting, sitting next to David is Tim O'Halloran, and, and similarly, we're very fortunate to have Tim in our community. Tim is the general manager of the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Uh, Tim came to Yolo County in July of 2003. Uh, when we hired him away from Kings River, where he was the Kings River water master. So another whole story about an incredibly complex river system in the state of California, and he was the water master of that system for five years. And prior to that, for 10 years, he was at the Imperial Irrigation District, that mammoth irrigation district, all the way down on the Mexico border. The, uh, the last few years he was there, he was the superintendent of water operations for that system. So if you're tracking his career, he's moving from north to south, or excuse me, south to north. Um, and we're hoping to keep uh, him, Tim, here in Yolo County as long as possible. Um, it, the, you know, the sidelights on Tim is that uh, before uh, going to work in the irrigation business, he uh, lived on a kibbutz in Israel. He speaks Hebrew and he collects maps. So we'll see where all of that leads us today. N next to Tim is uh, S Senator Lois Walk, and 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 everyone in this room knows the tremendous contributions of Senator Walk, uh, Assemblywoman Walk, City Council Member Walk. Uh, we all know that she loves the environment and is an avid, avid, avid advocate for it. Uh, we know that uh, she's done uh, um, the best she can to set up structures, to provide adequate resources, to provide adequate policy for the sustainable use of water in general, and certainly her very, very beloved Delta. Um, it's not the only thing Lois cares about, but um, it certainly is a, a lasting part of her career, 
Uh, of course, now she's in the Senate. When she was in the Assembly, they, uh, she was the first woman uh, chairwoman of the Assembly Water Parks and Wildlife. And I guess up until that point, the men in the Assembly wanted wildlife all to themselves. Uh, but, but Lois wrested that away from her, so we're, we're from them, so we're very grateful that she can be here. Next to Lois is uh, County Supervisor Jim Provenza. Um, and, and Jim is uh, he's here tonight uh, for a lot of reasons, but most importantly because he has been the supervisor on the Yolo County Board who's been tasked with the job of really being uh, the steward for California's water resources uh, on behalf of the Board of Supervisors, and he's been very actively involved in the conversations regarding the Bay Delta Conservation Plan and, and, and other issues that, uh, that will have direct uh, impacts on Yolo County. And so Jim's been here to do that. Jim's background, is, of course, is as a lawyer. Uh, he started in legal aid. He now works for prosecutors. So he sees, obviously likes to see things from different perspectives. He works for Los Angeles County, but we'll probably not talk about that tonight, <laughs> given how Los Angeles County oftentimes plays in water issues in Northern California. We're grateful for him to be here tonight. We're grateful for his work. On the, on the county uh, supervisors on behalf of, of all of us in Yolo County and water in particular. And finally, we have Jay Ziegler. And, and Jay is the Director of External Affairs and Policy for the Nature Conservancy in California, uh, which is a tremendous position to be in, not only for the lands and the projects of the Nature Conservancy, but because the Nature Conservancy is such a thought leader on sustainable uh, resource policy in the state of California and nationally. Um, and so we're, we're grateful that Jay, a Davis resident, is here with us tonight and for the work he does at the Nature Conservancy. Jay has a, has an, a, a very esteemed uh, background of his own, working uh, as deputy controller under Gray Davis, working for Secretary Bruce Babbitt at, uh, when he was Secretary of Interior, a really a, um, a collective but complementary set of policy challenges and backgrounds. Uh, that allows him to now work on long-term sustainability issues here uh, for the Nature Conservancy. So as you can see, we could sell tickets. We should have had more chairs, uh, but we're grateful for you to all be here today. And we'll begin uh, with you, Mr. Guy. All right. Uh, thank you, Jim. Can, can folks hear back in the room? Okay. Okay. Good. Well, uh, thank you all for making the time tonight to come out and talk about what obviously is a issue that is in the news in uh, California right now. Um, I'm going to start just to kind of give a little bit of an overview and set the stage, I think, for a lot of the other discussion that will uh, come after. Um, I'm, uh, as Jim mentioned, with Northern California Water Association, and so we represent uh, pretty much the water suppliers and the local governments from Sacramento north to Redding, and that includes the Sierra Nevada on the east, the Coast Range on the west. And I think as folks know, you know, that area, obviously it's a large area. It includes about 2 million acres of farms. Uh, family farms. It includes uh, six national wildlife refuges, 50 state wildlife areas. It ha we have about half of the uh, threatened and endangered species in California, including things like the uh, salmon that we all care about. Um, and of course, you have uh, the capital of uh, Sacramento, the cities like Davis, and uh, many other uh, communities sprinkled throughout the, uh, the region. And I think the thing I'm just going to start off with is, of course, everybody's hearing a lot about the drought. And I guess I'll just say that it's very real in the Sacramento Valley. And let me just give you a little bit of a flyover for those who uh, kind of want to see what exactly is going on in the region. The important thing is it's affecting all of those uses that I just mentioned in, in various ways. Is what we have, uh, and Tim will talk about it from a Yolo County perspective, but we have this kind of uh, strange convergence this year where we came into a year with low carryover storage in the major reservoirs, coupled with a very dry year. 2013, I believe, is characterized as the driest year on record. <clears throat> and of course, until uh, some of these recent storms, it's been pretty, pretty dry. So it's really the convergence of that low carryover storage that we usually depend upon when we have dry years, combined with that low uh, precipitation. And that's what is creating the, the dynamic that we're now uh, seeing. In the uh, Sacramento Valley, um, Tim is going to talk about the situation at, uh, in Yolo County and the flood control water con, so I'll let him do that. As you go a little bit uh, up uh, north in the valley, um, folks that are in Dunnegan north uh, know that on the west side of the valley right now are looking at a zero allocation from the Bureau of Reclamation, and we'll be relying entirely upon groundwater and possibly maybe as the year goes on with some water transferred from other users within the valley. As you go to the east, uh, folks along the river 
Um, and that includes uh, folks from uh, Conway North, RD 108 in Yolo County. Uh, they have the so-called uh, settlement contracts. They are now looking at a 40% water supply uh, from the Bureau of Reclamation. We're hoping that number will continue to go up with these storms and with some other things that are emerging. Uh, but again, they're looking at right now at a 40% uh, water supply. As you go to the east, uh, folks over on the Feather River are looking at 50% of their supplies. And then as you go into the Sierra foothills, uh, you have uh, dynamic much like you have here in Yolo County where folks have their own reservoirs. And you'll see anywhere from a zero, alloc zero allocation up to a larger, uh, close to maybe 75 to 100% even in some areas. But again, it's really kind of a mixed match just depending on the storage reservoirs. And then of course, as you go into the city of Sacramento, I think folks saw the dynamic that emerged uh, that with Folsom being down so low earlier this year, there were several entities in the Sacramento metropolitan area that were looking at uh, having some access problems to water. Even though they had the rights to the water, they weren't going to be able to pump it. The storms uh, seem to allay that, at least for the moment. Um, and there's enough water in Folsom now to access. But that was really on the verge of a, a pretty major uh, disaster for some of the uh, urban areas within the uh, Sacramento metropolitan area. And then you have like the wildlife refuges that are looking at right now around 40% uh, supplies. So as you look across the board, uh, major water supply reductions, of course, uh, one of the things that happens in the valley, as folks know, is that either if you don't have surface water, a lot of folks will pump groundwater. And in a lot of places, that's the way it's designed. Tim will talk some about that. But in other areas, we're just going to be looking this year, I think, at unprecedented levels of groundwater pumping that we just haven't seen before in the Sacramento Valley. And of course, that's why that's going to become a whole debate this year that uh, Lois and others will probably be uh, talking about. So as what uh, kind of we look at as we kind of think about the um, kind of this year is I think the first thing is we're trying to look at water management scenarios where you can achieve multiple benefits. And for example, on the Sacramento River system, we know that there's a certain amount of water, for example, behind Lake Shasta. And so our hope is, is that, for example, that you can utilize that water to provide cold water to benefit salmon, and that then you can divert that water for use in the refuges, you can divert that water for use by the farms, and that that will help the birds in the Pacific Flyway. And so I think there's going to be a lot of opportunities this year to look at kind of how do you stretch that available water as far as you can and use it for these uh, multiple benefits. And I think that's the strategy that at least we're uh, trying to work with. We're working with folks like Jay and others and uh, trying to explore how to best uh, do that. Um, Jim had asked me to talk and uh, also uh, Supervisor Saylor will be talking a little bit later about the North State Water Alliance and I'll just give a couple of quick background on that and then we can talk about it more as folks would like. But this was an en entity that essentially uh, many of you remember I think the leadership I give a lot of credit usually to uh, Helen Thompson uh, with the uh, rural urban connections process that brought the rural and the urban parts of the Sacramento Valley together some years ago through this uh, RUC strategy. And I think that has really been a great platform to have a variety of discussions that uh, really have now led to the formation of this North State Water Alliance, where we're speaking with one voice um, as the North State Water Alliance. And the idea is that we're going to be talking about the Sacramento Valley uh, in a unified way. And that uh, there's three pieces to what we're talking about. We're obviously looking at ways to operate uh, the projects, the Central Valley Project, the State Water Project, as well as obviously the folks that have their own mm -hmm. projects in a way that maximizes the benefit for Northern California. And I think that's this year has obviously highlighted the importance of that, and we can sure talk about that in a lot more detail. Infrastructure, second piece, and again, this is going to be part of the bond discussion that uh, Senator Wolk will talk about and others, um, but obviously we need to have in infrastructure, and that's infrastructure for conservation, for fish and bird projects, as well as uh, things in our view like Sites Reservoir, which we think could add a lot of flexibility into the Sacramento Valley system and, and take some pressure off the region as well. And then obviously the third uh, leg of that is what uh, we're calling kind of regulatory certainty. And right now it's really hard to manage water when you always kind of have a regulatory cloud hanging over you. And I think right now, at least in the state of California, uh, we could benefit from aligning some of the regulatory policies of the state of California in a way that really allow folks uh, like Tim and others to manage water, I think, in a uh, much more effective uh, manner. So um, 
I think the, the bottom line is, is I think we're looking for solutions in the North State. I think that's what the North State Water Alliance is about, to try to invest in our own resources as we go forward with help from things like general obligation bonds and some other opportunities to partner. Um, but I think we really need to invest in this region in our water supplies, much like uh, folks around this room have done for their water supplies. So I'm going to stop there and we'll look forward to the discussion as we go forward. Thanks, David. Why don't you go ahead and pick it up, Tim? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks uh, for coming out tonight. And, uh, uh, you know, I see a lot of familiar faces in the audience, but I see a lot of new faces, and that's really great. And for those people that aren't as involved in water in Yolo County as, uh, as uh, some of the rest of us, I think this panel really represents the collaboration that's really special. One of the, Jim mentioned my career moving north, south to north. Uh, everybody hear me okay back there? Okay. Uh, you know, one of the things I've really enjoyed about this area is the collaboration between urban and agriculture and between just all the citizens of Yolo County. And, and that's part of the story, the rich story of uh, Yolo County water, uh, the collaboration that exists. And I'd also like to mention Jim hit on the, my introduction about being the water master of the Kings River. When they asked me to talk tonight, you know, I said, well, what, what do you want? And he said, well, you know, kind of the plumbing, the basics of, uh, of uh, Yolo County water. And I thought, geez, that's great. I've gone from being this almost biblical title of water master to being a plumber, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's it. But anyway, I'm going to, in, in five minutes to five to seven minutes, give you a a snapshot, a lot of you know it already, some of you maybe know at least parts of it a lot better than I do, but uh, just give you kind of, for, for opening up the discussion, just a sense of where the water comes from and, and how it works here in Yolo County from an institutional perspective. So I'm going to try to answer three questions. Where Yolo County's water comes from and where it is used? Who manages the water in Yolo County? And what are the big picture issues facing Yolo County water resources going forward? Uh, and I, I showed Senator Woke a, a little graphic up here that I can't share with everybody, but uh, 33 water agencies in Yolo County. And, and of course, Senator Lois has been a longtime player in, Cal in Yolo County water, and I think she was even a little taken aback by the number there. So there's a lot of players. I represent one district. It's a pretty big district for the ag water in Yolo County, but it's by no means representative of all the water in Yolo County and certainly doesn't uh, deliver any urban water. Um, but the district, the Yellow County Flood Control and Water Conservation District, and if you have a hard time saying that, just remember YCFC WCD, and it comes a lot, e <laughs> comes a lot easier. Uh, well done. Uh, you want to give it a try? No. Uh, I we, speak Hebrew a lot better. <laughs> we, uh, we operate the Clear Lake Cash Creek water system, what's called the watershed. And of course, that's the water that's 90 miles north of it. I'm sure most everybody in the room knows where the Cape Bay Valley is and Cape Bay. Our diversion dam, our facility that starts distributing the water through a network of 160 miles of canals that run through western Yolo County, starts 90 miles upstream of that in Lake County at Clear Lake, a natural body of water. And, and, previous, and also up there is a reservoir called Indian Valley Reservoir that it's not that well known, but it's very significant, and it also represents a very fantastic story for Yolo County, where the, the, the cities actually helped finance the building of Indian Valley Reservoir, which is used primarily exclusively for agricultural water. Why would the cities of Woodland and Davis pay for a, a, a reservoir that benefits agriculture? Well, the reason is the groundwater that David mentioned, it connects us all. and, and uh, Four of the three, four of the th three of the four incorporated cities in Yolo County, Woodland, Winters, and I see the city manager and the mayor of Win Winters here. That's great. Uh, and Woodland have been traditionally on groundwater. So what we do as a farming area, the the water use, the groundwater we use impacts the water availability for the urban areas, at least of those three cities. Two of which, as most people in this room undoubtedly are aware, are switching over to Sacramento City, uh, Sacramento River water shortly. West Sacramento is the other city that, that is in Yolo County and they, uh, they take uh, Sacramento River water already. They got a great uh, ride on the Sacramento River and they do that. But so there's Cache Creek, Clear Lake system. It's a rain fed system. It's always a, a little bit uh, funny for me when people ask, uh, how's the snow melt? You know, climate change, how's it going to affect the snow melt into, into Lake, Lake Clear Lake? And I say, well, it doesn't work that way. It's a rain fed system. But uh, 
But that uh, the Sacramento River, David hit on the, you know, we, we, our system, the Clear Lake system goes out to the Yellow Bypass. Everybody knows where the Yellow Bypass is, right? And, and along the eastern, eastern side of Yolo County is the, most of these water agencies, the settlement contractors, RD Reclamation District 108, Conway Ranch, River Garden Farms, tremendous water rights on the, on the Sacramento River. Dunnegan Water District's an exception to that. They have a junior water right up in Dunnegan, so they have, as David said, a zero allocation this year. Uh, the other ones have 40 and hopefully more for this year, but, but so that's it. So imagine Yolo County, the western side fed by Clear Lake and Cache Creek system, the eastern side by the Sacramento River, and then the cities on groundwater. So that's the plumbing, if you will. It's not as good as Moses splitting the water, but... Uh, um, Lake Berryessa, we're in Davis, you know, Puda Creek and Winters is here and, uh, you know, the Puda Creek's a tremendous uh, landmark for them. But from a water supply perspective, we don't get anything. As Helen Thompson is, and I've talked about before, you know, Yellow County missed a big opportunity back when they built Lake Berryessa to sign up for contract water. It you know, sometimes the historical decisions that aren't made are as important as the ones that are made. And uh, think of what the cities of Davis and Woodlands and Winters could be, uh, you know, enjoying the, the better, you know, the water quality of Lake Berryessa if back when they built that they'd sign up for the contracts. Uh, the uh, last thing I'll say on where the water comes from and all that, all of our water is owned by the state of California. We, you know, we always, we get a little self-righteous sometimes, where, you know, everywhere you go up and down the state, and I've been up the, from the Mexican border to up here, uh, people say, well, we've got to protect our water. Well, the truth of the matter is the water uh, is, uh, belongs to the state of California. We have water rights to use it beneficially and reasonably. And, uh, and what we do have in Yolo County that's very nice is very strong water rights, whether it's pre-1914 on the Clear Lake system or the settlement contracts on the Sacramento River. We've got tremendous water rights, but we don't own the water. And I always remind people, be a little careful when you say protecting our water because you go up to Lake County, I go up to Lake County a lot, and they have a different view of how we're using our water. <laughs> uh, who manages the water? The 32 water management entities. Uh, um, I already hit that. Let me just close with talking about current and future critical water resource issues. Uh, I'm sure somewhere Jim Provenza will talk, or, or, or Senator Wolk possibly talk about the BDCP. You know, that's a big deal. It gets a lot of airplay, but, you know, I worry about that a lot, not in terms of whether it happens or not, but whether it allows, it takes so much focus, takes the oxygen mm -hmm. out of the room, as they say, okay. that, that we don't work on the things, that protecting the, the, the infrastructure that we have, improving the groundwater, that we have a lot more ability to actually do something about than some of the bigger picture issues. So, so I don't focus on the BDCP. Other people have to, you know, certainly Yolo County for land use reasons has to involve themselves deeply in that. Uh, but what I do think about is the short term. There's this year, and Senator Wolk could probably talk more about this, but there's ground, gonna be groundwater legislation. What opportunities does that present for us? What, what threats and opportunities? You know, the, the future of my district relies on conjunctive use, conjunctive water use management, using the groundwater with the surface water. Maybe there's some tools that we can get out of this regulation, but. Anyway, the point is, is that this next year and a half, couple of years, is going to consume a lot of our time on the short term here with groundwater as, we, as the state looks at regulating that in a bigger way. On a longer term basis, what I think is going to dominate uh, the water managers of the future's interest in Yolo County and throughout the state is water quality issues. Uh, the irrigated lands program, the stormwater for the agricultural areas, the stormwater programs for the urban areas, tremendously expensive things. You know, everybody wants good water, good quality, everybody wants to protect the environment. But some of these issues are really gonna change our way of life. Certainly the Davis Woodland, uh, uh, Woodland Davis water treatment plant that's coming online is a res response to water quality regulations. And there's gonna be more of that as we go along. And then lastly, I'll just say land use issues in general. Especially as you look, uh, I took uh, Don Saylor out, uh, Supervisor Saylor out a couple weeks ago looking near, near this town of Winters and the tremendous conversion to permanent crops. Anywhere you drive, I was just in San Luis Obispo last week, anywhere you drive throughout the state, this conversion to permanent crops. And of course that's driving a lot of the groundwater thinking. But anyway, that's my snapshot of the, of the water system in Yolo County. Again, I just uh, applaud everybody in Yolo County that works collaboratively together. One thing I did miss that is really, really important, 
The Water Resources Association of Yolo County, an umbrella organization, worked on an integrated regional, integrated regional water management plan. Petraea's back there. She was a key part of it in 2007, and we've updated it. But it's a way to unite, to, to work on our water issues in, in an integrated fashion and collaborative fashion. And uh, again, I know there's a lot of people in this room that have been involved in that process. So I'll close with that. Thank you very much, Tim. Senator Wolk. Thank you. I think uh, it's really good to be here. Thanks for pulling all this together. And Tim just gave you uh, really what is an incredibly wonderful summary of water uh, in Yolo County and water in California and what the issues are. Um, it's especially timely. The drought gives us an opportunity because people are focused on water, which they usually are not statewide. So this is a real opportunity to move the lots of, lots of issues forward and lots of policy forward. And the governor certainly has taken on uh, the issue of groundwater management and groundwater monitoring, and um, you're absolutely correct. That's going to be a major issue over the next six months. I'm focused on a water bond, uh, and uh, I believe that there will be an effort uh, uh, by the governor to put together uh, a bond that will be on the November ballot. Uh, it's not an easy task, uh, but um, uh, a necessary one. Uh, currently, there's an $11.4 billion bond that's on the ballot that most people agree uh, does not have a chance, even with the drought of uh, the heightened concern about the drought uh, passing for a number of reasons. Uh, there are a number of qualities that a successful bond uh, will need in order to pass. Um, it will need to be smaller than 11.4. It will have to have absolutely no pork and no earmarks in the bond. It will have to be a consensus, full of, it will have to have consensus projects, uh, projects that are very important to the local regions uh, and can be achieved over the next five to 10 years. Um, it can have no relationship at whatsoever to the tunnels um, or to uh, the BDCP. And if those, um, if, that ge if those general principles are met, I think we have a shot at passing a water bond. And when I say a shot, I mean a shot. It's not uh, inevitable. Water bonds never pass with a whole lot of support. Uh, they're in the 50s, uh, and often the low 50s. So it's really important that it be that, that the projects that are, that are uh, delineated, uh, that the areas that are focused on are consensus and relate to the entire uh, state. Um, my bond, 848, uh, is 6.8 billion. It's probably still too high, uh, but it focuses on near-term solutions over the next five to ten years uh, in five broad categories. The first is the development or diversification of existing regional water supplies, using all of the tools and the techniques that local water districts are interested in, uh, and that is recycling groundwater cleanup, conservation, stormwater recapture and reuse, desalination. Um, those are the projects that local water districts throughout the state are very much interested in moving forward and that ratepayers are willing to fund, and that's critical. The second general area has to do with addressing this bond needs and must address critical drinking water issues. There are over a million citizens in the state of California that do not have access to, high, to good quality, drinkable uh, primary water supply. Uh, that's unacceptable in the eighth largest economy of the world, and everyone is committed to, a, um, to meeting these critical drinking water needs, many of which are in the Central Valley. Um, the third major area will be the Delta, uh, ecosystem restoration uh, and levee enhancement in the Delta. The fourth broad category has to do with storage, both groundwater, above, below ground, groundwater, and surface storage projects. Included in that would be sediment removal in the 170 plus dams that we have. UC Berkeley just did a study that showed that over 50%, on average, 50% of the capacity of existing storage um, reservoirs uh, are, are plugged up because of sediment. For a whole lot less money than building new dams, we can get the sediment out, and we ought to start doing that, uh, in addition to whatever other projects rise to the top and can be funded. Um, in addition, seismic ret retrofit would increase our exist some existing storage facilities. St. Louis, San Louis is one of them. Um, the last area, the last broad category, is watershed efforts. 
uh, encouraging those, supporting those, the existing watershed efforts throughout the state of California that are very much, um, uh, these watershed groups are partners with the state, partners with the local community and with landowners, and actually do a tremendous amount in terms of water quality locally. So 848 is out there. There are seven, eight other bonds um, as well. Um, but I think that ultimately what matters is the consensus, the local the projects that bear some relationship to the needs of the local, a strong relationship to the needs of the local community, and not having uh, a bond be a referendum on a, um, a controversial project like BDCP or the tunnels. So that's what I think we need to move forward with. Thank you very much, Senator. Supervisor Provenza. Thank you. I'm going to stand so I can see everybody. Uh, thank you. Uh, they gave us these water glasses, and as you can see, I drank all mine. Uh, Jim drank all his. I'm uh, saving. I have mine. Got, got a little bit left. <laughs> Tough summer. Ahead. Tim's is pretty much gone. I have mine. So I'm going to propose now that I'm still thirsty. I'm going to propose we, do, we redistribute this water so I can have some more. <laughs> But uh, seriously, uh, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, water, obviously, is a very important issue. And uh, thinking of the time frames, uh, back to the Berryessa decisions, which were made over 50 years ago, uh, that's that uh, 50 years, that's an important number of years because when we look at the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, uh, the state is looking at issuing uh, permits that will last for 50 years. So the decisions we make now uh, could very well and will affect us for the next 50 years and beyond. So that it, it, uh, it demonstrates why uh, our Board of Supervisors has placed such a great importance on making uh, the correct decisions, and hopefully we are. Uh, what what our, our fundamental principle really is what we call the YOLO way, and, and I, I can't take credit for that. Uh, uh, Helen Thompson, uh, Betsy Marchand and, and uh, some of the, the, the supervisors here uh, that uh, serve with me on the board uh, have been an integral part of that. Uh, but what that concept is on the YOLO way is that everybody works together and makes everything work. You don't, you don't have one interest trump another interest. And the, the best example uh, I have of that is the, the gravel mining that, that we have in, uh, in YOLO County. There was a fight between environmentalists uh, and the gravel companies, which was settled with a historic settlement that, that has uh, money uh, from every uh, ton of gravel that's taken uh, from the ground. There's money put back into restoration. So we're actually uh, creating a parkway, which is going to be better than what was there before we, we got into the effort. And that, that's what we refer to as the YOLO way, getting people to work together to make things work. And in the context of water and the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, that, that uh, Everybody thinks of the Bay Delta Conservation Plan as the tunnel project, and it is. Uh, we don't know if that's going to happen or not, and it, it's not necessarily, it's not going to be my decision whether that goes forward, and we could all take uh, various positions on it, but that will either happen or not. But along with that, in the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, are over 20 other conservation projects. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there's a federal biological opinion, a federal court case that's ordering us to do certain things uh, that we're going to have to do regardless of whether that goes forward. Well, how does that affect Yolo County? It affects Yolo County because uh, both the courts through the biological opinions and BDCP have fo focused on the Yolo bypass as a place to do a habitat for fish, to uh, uh, protect, preserve, and, and, and actually enhance uh, salmon and other fish species. And so our first question was, well, how does that affect us? And uh, can we really do this? Can, can we do some of these projects that the state and federal government want to do that the uh, water contractors have been told they have to do if they're going to continue to export water? And that, that, is, that has some significance in, in even uh, outside of, of the area of habitat protection because you know, every year water goes into the ocean that might otherwise flow down to other people who need that water uh, because uh, of the need to address the needs of, of the various fish species. So can we do this? Can we address that issue without adversely affecting Yolo County's interests? And so what we did was a, uh, we, we started with several studies. Uh, we uh, started with an agricultural impact study where we uh, looked at all the farming in the bypass. We looked at all the things that would 
potentially suffer if you were to essentially lower or put a gate on the Fremont Weir and put more water into the Yolo Bypass. Uh, putting more water into the bypass could affect agriculture, uh, could also affect the, uh, the uh, Vic Fazio wildlife area and all the terrestrial species. Uh, and it could also indirectly affect the Port of West Sacramento, which is important uh, to us economically because the port uh, exports a lot of the rice. Well, we got good news and bad news when we did the study. We found that some of the iterations of those projects would put so much water so late into the year into the Yolo Bypass that the farmers would be unable to plant, that we'd lose our rice crops, uh, crops, some or all of our rice crops, and suffer uh, damage to the tune of $9 million a year in 2010 dollars for the next 50 years in total economic damage. Well, that is unacceptable. But what our study also showed was that there's ways to do it that don't result in those consequences. If, if, you, were to, if you were to increase uh, uh, flooding into the bypass but end it earlier, end it by early March, uh, the uh, loss is in, is in the uh, hundreds of thousands or in a, in, a, in a range that could be addressed. So the next step is we uh, began negotiations with the state. And we said we really want to establish three things. We want to, first of all, make sure that the project is tailored so that it doesn't do uh, lasting damage over time to the agricultural industry in Yolo County. Uh, secondly, for any loss that is incurred for agriculture or for the economy of Yolo County, we would like there to be compensation. After all, we're willing to help the rest of the state, but we shouldn't have to pay for it. We're, we're paying for our own water, our own increased rates, and everything else. We shouldn't have to pay uh, for uh, benefits for other parts of the state. And we researched what's happened in other parts of the state and found that in various water projects throughout the state, uh, the w water contractors and, and the state have paid compensation to areas that have suffered in order to keep those areas whole. So we said, let's, let's do a reasonable project that balances interests. Let's address it just like Yolo County would do and balance all those interests. And then secondly, uh, let's make sure that the county doesn't suffer economically. And then thirdly, we said, uh, we want to be involved in the governance of that project. If you're going to affect our land use in Yolo County for the next 50 years, we need to be in a co-equal role with the state and federal government on any uh, governance uh, entity. And if you meet those three conditions, we think we can help you and we think we can go forward. Regardless of what happens with the tunnel project or anything else, we think that we can work together to balance interests and to make everything work. And right now we're in a series of negotiations. Our staff is meeting on a, a daily or weekly basis. Uh, uh, with uh, the state and federal government. Uh, our supervisors, Oscar Villegas and myself, are the water committee. Uh, we're meeting, meeting once a month with Secretary Laird, and then our board is, is meeting regularly to discuss all of these issues and to set policy. We hope to have some type of agreement worked out with the state and federal government by September. We've set that deadline, and it's been agreed to by all sides. Uh, we're very hopeful and optimistic that this can be done, but it's really the only way things can move forward. You, you can't uh, have everything tilted in one direction or another. You have to take care of the environment, you have to take care of agriculture, take care of habitat, take care of water. And those things are possible, but you have to have uh, an open mind to doing it in a way that protects everyone's interests. Uh, there was mention of a multi-benefit project, and that's another thing we're looking at as to whether we could combine uh, some of the work that's going on in the flood control area with what's going on with, with uh, the Habitat and BDCP to see if we could, we could develop a project that would uh, limit impacts and uh, result in multiple benefits and, and decrease costs. Those things are all possible if we work together. And then lastly, on a, on a broader scale though, I, I don't uh, know how many of you saw that article in the New York Times uh, this morning about global climate change, but the, the science is such that it is getting worse and it's starting to affect us now, right now. Uh, I asked one of the scientists at the Delta Conservancy if our current weather might be a result, and the response was, well, we don't know, but there's a high probability that it is. So uh, the other thing Yolo County is trying to do is our part to address uh, climate change issues by, uh, by developing alternative energy sources for, county, for the county and encouraging, uh, by uh, that example, others to do the same. So I, I'm optimistic going forward, but we have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Okay.
Thank you very much, Supervisor. Uh, now I just want to remind everybody that uh, if you've got a question, um, fill out your card and hand them to, off to the side and, and, and uh, they'll get picked up. And of course, if you don't do that, you get my questions. So I'm sure your questions are better than my questions. So I encourage you to take the time as, as Jay uh, completes our round here for, uh, for you to put your thoughts on paper. So Jay? Uh, Jim asked me to talk a bit about sustainability of water use in California. And I do want to say and acknowledge this panel, um, Senator Wolk, Supervisor Provenza, uh, David and Tim, Yolo County is really one of the places in California where you have to conclude that the glass is more than half full. And so, uh, and I say that for a number of reasons. I think um, the county has been a progressive leader uh, in, in water management uh, under Tim's leadership, under the engagement, constant engagement of the Board of Supervisors as a model uh, for how to more sustainably uh, manage water resources. How important is that? Well, by the most conservative estimate, California's water balance is at least a million and a half uh, acre feet out of balance. That is, in an average year, we're using a lot more than we get in the watershed. Now, that sounds overwhelming, but if you just take the Sacramento River Basin, that's 20 million acre feet, roughly, of water that um, falls into the basin from the uh, most of it uh, that uh, is stored uh, in the Sierra Nevada. And so this isn't an, an unsolvable problem, but we just have to work a lot more effectively together in order to get there. Um, uh, David and, and um, Senator Wolk and Jim have also noted the importance of groundwater management. The irony of California is that we have one of the most progressive sets of laws about surface water resources, and we completely ignore uh, the relationship to groundwater. Uh, we can't do that any longer. And so I think that in this crisis moment, um, under Senator Wolk's leadership and, and uh, that of others in the legislature, we're about to get around that corner and acknowledge that these uh, seemingly, uh, I, I think all of us could agree, connected uh, resources actually have to be managed in a more integrated way. And uh, to do that, um, will require a breakthrough and an acknowledgement that we all have a responsibility to each other, a uh, responsibility to future generations um, to better track this and this resource in a way that we can confidently have it there um, when we're in drought periods uh, so that we can rely on that groundwater resource uh, more actively. And I think that Senator Wolk has underscored the importance of the water bond as a tool to bring more flexibility to the system. We ha actually need incentives for active conjunctive use projects that help us store water in the ground, help us store water uh, above ground uh, where it makes sense, um, and to more actively uh, monitor that resource on a statewide basis. And so I think that we are using this moment of crisis um, to actually come together in a dialogue to better understand um, the precarious nature of California's water management system. Um, to date, uh, about a billion dollars in federal monies have been directed uh, to uh, emergency response in the drought. Um, and I want to just kind of speak for a moment about the environmental challenge of this, because um, so uh, about 700 million of those funds are from state agencies. Um, uh, 222 million from uh, the federal government, and of that total, uh, 2.3 million is dedicated uh, to uh, environmental um, response related to the drought. And I just want to underscore that we, as an organization, and the Nature Conservancy has about 100,000 members in California, pride ourselves on finding common ground solutions. David alluded to partnership agreements that we work on. Uh, with the Sacramento River Water Agencies along the Sacramento River watershed. We are a landowner and a farmer uh, in the Delta. Uh, we have uh, habitat and, and policy interests throughout California. Um, but at its heart, we, we have to kind of come to, to terms with some of the challenges um, that, that are just right in front of us in a painful way. And as hard as this drought is going to be for farmers, and I have a great deal of sympathy for the challenges that farmers are going to face throughout California, uh, and as hard as this drought is for communities already, and some 100 communities have, have declared uh, shortages of less than 200 days uh, of available water supply, if you are a bird or a fish, 
it is really, really tough out there. And it is going to get worse as the year goes along. And, and I do appreciate um, partners that are at the table that are really striving to make our environmental laws work. And it's really refreshing to work with this group of people to find exemplary projects of uh, protecting water quality for people and for natural systems and for p protecting wetlands and broader habitat values for migratory birds and to try to keep enough water in the system um, to keep the legacy of salmon in California alive. And um, these are things that I think all of us on a conceptual level buy into as really critical priorities. But this is going to be stressed in a way that it has never been before, this balance between the needs of people and the environment. And it's a pleasure to be here in Davis tonight. Um, what I would leave you with is that I think we need to work together actively to make sure that we use this crisis to push reform down the road, to make sure that Senator Wolk's efforts in the water bond are rewarded so that we have flexible incentives for the right kind of conjunctive use projects, so that we can undertake monitoring, water management, better groundwater management together in a more holistic way to really address California's water management challenges. And um, with that, um, let me turn it back to Jim. But thank you for the opportunity to be with you tonight. So why don't we pause and give them all a great round of applause. <laughs> for their leadership and their clear thinking and their concise answers. Uh, so hopefully we've got some clear and concise questions, maybe even clear and, clear and concise answers. So who's got them? All right, here comes Petraea. Never takes her very long. So the first question, I think, is going to deal with one of our big themes this year and, and, and hopefully going forward is this interaction between groundwater and surface water. And particularly this year, given the large number of new ag wells that are being drilled, how's that going to impact groundwater in rural areas like Esparto? So Tim, you do a lot of monitoring specifically in Yolo County. What, what, what's your expectation for what happens with our groundwater in Yolo County? Do I have to be concise? <laughs> Um, yeah, 40 minutes. <laughs> First of all, how do we know? The district, in, along with the Water Resource Association of County, uh, has an gr extensive groundwater monitoring program. We have uh, the district alone has 150 wells that we monitor that cover our area from uh, Winters uh, to Davis, along the southern part of our boundary, up to Dunnigan, up to the Dunnigan Hills in our north part of our boundary. So, and then we've got a number of other the. The county, the Cache Creek uh, Gravel Program has wells that they monitor. Uh, the cities provide data. It's all on a regional, it's all on a database that's on the WRA website. If you want to look at it, it's a little bit techy. It's a little, in fact, you got to sign up for a 10 minute training course for it that's done online. But anyway, so how do we know and what's going to happen this year? First off, uh, uh, if I didn't say it exactly like this, Yolo County in general has really good groundwater situations. And of course, you're talking, uh, that's coming from a guy that spent some years down in the San Joaquin Valley where things are just going on a steep decline all the way. So everything's relative in life. But, uh, but generally speaking, uh, we're in good shape. There's places uh, I worry about the Yolo Zamora area, which is up uh, um, near, near, near Cache Creek at Yolo, going north of there. That's a ground where they don't. The Tehama Canal was originally expected to extend down to there and bring surface water. They didn't extend that back in those days, so they relied solely on groundwater. There's a zone of depression there. City of Winters, we're watching them close, closely. Not so much the city, but the area around there. Uh, there's a lot of new plantings on what were uh, uh, grazing grounds and, and a lot of new wells in the ground. Uh, other than those two hot spots, though, I think we're in pretty good shape. And even in those, uh, where we, we watch the trend come up and down, the, the hydrograph, if you will, and I think we're in pretty good shape. That doesn't mean your well. If somebody's sitting out there with a well that's down at 100 foot and they just have a neighbor that put one in at 600 foot right next to them, they're going to see impacts. Uh, and, you know, and that's, that's uh, one of the things that we have to struggle with as a community is what, what do we do about those situations. But overall, as a regional groundwater basin, I think we're in pretty good shape this year. 
Okay, thanks, Tim. Let's take it uh, from the legislative perspective. Is if there is going to be legislation this year, um, uh, Senator, do you have some thoughts on where you see that going and what good legislation might look like? And, and David, I know you can weigh in on, on that from a NACWA perspective as well. I think the importance of groundwater to California, um, uh, not, uh, not just in, in a drought year, but just in general, is that it's about 30% of the water supply. Um, and in drought years, it rises to 40 and above. Uh, and the fact that the main thing that you need to know is that we don't know the quality or the quantity or how it behaves. Uh, so one of the first jobs is to figure out to measure it, to figure out what it, where it is, how much of it there is. Um, and that we, we don't, we must have that information to begin with. And it's been a tremendous struggle in the legislature to do anything with groundwater because people um, guard their groundwater um, and are afraid that if that information is out there that the next step will be somebody will take it, uh, namely the state probably. But that's really uh, the wrong way to look at it. The first step toward protecting it is knowing its condition its recharge capabilities and how it's being used. Um, beyond that, you, you run into all kinds of very difficult questions. Um, Tim made reference to cropping pattern changes that have happened. Uh, in the South Central Valley, the, uh, what used to be uh, crops that were, that were put in, um, uh, again, depending on the amount of water they would get, uh, have now changed so that they're year-round orchards being put in and grapes and things that need to be um, irrigated all year round. That creates a very different kind of water profile and portfolio than, um, than has existed previously. Uh, they have the right to do that, but um, water is more than just someone's individual right to do whatever they want. Um, especially when water is a resource uh, for all of us. Um, there's also the issue of subsidence, which has been increasing dramatically, existed earlier and has gotten worse, certainly in the Central Valley and elsewhere. Um, and then there's this whole issue of fracking, um, which requires tremendous amounts of water and is a, uh, going to be a tremendous boon um, in, uh, the southern, you know, in, the, in the central part of the state. Uh, a well takes about a million gallons of water a year. Think about it. So, you know, this may be a desirable energy policy, but it has incredible implications on our groundwater. So there are a number of very serious issues, and I applaud the governor. He's stepped into this, and you know when Jerry Brown steps into something, mm -hmm. uh, as we know from redevelopment, and we know from the Enterprise Zone tax credit change and wanting to fix the budget, um, he usually gets it done. So that's why it's important for us in Yolo County, using the Yolo way, to figure out what's important about our groundwater and, and what we need to know about it. And therefore, that's the first step in managing it and protecting it. So David, uh, broadening the perspective just a little bit for all of your members throughout the valley where, where water, groundwater regulation is a pretty controversial idea, uh, do you see something moving forward and how do we reconcile some of those uh, longstanding concerns? Yeah, good question, uh, Jim. Um, let me just first start with, I think the, um, my sense is, is that the groundwater discussion to me feels different than it's ever been before. I think. I think this uh, drought in a strange way is probably helping bring it into focus. And I think that it just feels to me like it's a, it's a different conversation. As uh, Senator Wolk mentioned, the, uh, the governor has made some very uh, strong statements in uh, both his California Water Action Plan and his State of the State. And most of his comments have focused, I think, on areas that have had chronic overdraft and the idea that in those areas uh, that the state, uh, in this case presumably the state water board at this point it seems like, will need to somehow intervene to try to help those areas kind of come back into, 
into balance. And so I suspect, and again, Senator Wolk can tell me if she feels otherwise, but I think that will be at least the first part of the conversation is something focused around those. And as, as Tim mentioned, we don't have a lot of that in the Sacramento Valley at the time being. Uh, with that said, there are some areas, as Tim suggested, that we're watching very closely. Uh, we have been uh, doing some, a variety of, uh, of studies, a variety of work in the Valley, including Yolo County, to try to look at some of those issues, look at some of the additional uh, cropping changes, uh, to look at some of the additional demands on water in general. And we're working with uh, Nature Conservancy and some others to try to understand that, you know, kind of the relationship between surface and groundwater in different parts of the region as well, so that we can look at concepts of sustainability, uh, you know, in a little bit uh, better, better way. So I guess my kind of quick sense is that I think the first round of legislation, I'm guessing we'll focus on those areas that are gonna be chronically overdrafted. But then I think the challenge for us as a region is to come together and figure out what we think ought to move forward. You know, what do we want as a region? And again, I think, you know, I look at Yellow County and what Tim described, you know, the database. Again, let me give out a call out again to, to you know, then Assemblyman Thompson. You know, she uh, carried a bill back in 2001, I believe it was, that was uh, AB 303 that helped us in the valley, throughout the valley, including Yolo County, understand the resource better. And we just continue to build upon that database, to build upon that understanding. And I think that awareness is really the, the starting point for this. And then I think as a region, we need to develop kind of regional strategies, much like, you know, folks did when they created the Yolo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District. Did I say that right? YCFWD? Yeah. Yeah. YCFWD, yeah. You should have stuck with the first oh, one. Oh, yeah, I did it better, yeah. The kibbutz, I mean, the, uh, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, the Yolo way, that's much easier to say. So, uh, anyway, I think that's at least my thought is, is that we develop kind of some of these regional sub-basin type approaches, much like you've done the, the Yolo way, so to speak. We have a number of questions that really deal with the rubric of efficiency uh, issues and or reuse and or desal and uh, not sure who the best uh, person on the panel. Maybe, maybe you, Senator, with your, just your perspective on it. Do you see where we are with this drought moving forward? Um, some of those uh, more extensive, either reuse or desal or efficiency measures that that uh, we've been progressing relatively slowly toward in California. Is the time we at a tipping point for those as well? And what do you see happening to move those along? I think uh, one of the unifying features of all of the bonds is a focus on these uh, re regional water um, uh, uh, projects uh, that encompass all the things that, that Jim mentioned. Those are the things that throughout the state of California, uh, local water agencies are interested in doing. They're interested in reuse, they're interested in conservation, further conservation, they're interested in cleaning up the dirty groundwater, all things that ratepayers are willing to um, uh, to support and desalination as well. Um, the integrated regional water management plans of the state, of various parts of the state, um, the chunk of the bond money, uh, assuming we get a bond, um, about a fifth of the money would go toward uh, whatever projects uh, the integrated regional water management um, projects have, you know, uh, plans have listed. And they're different from one place to another. They can be desal in some places. It can be conservation in others. It can be other things in, in other places. So it rewards the local efforts. Um, and that's really what I think people are very, very much focused on. There's been a paradigm shift. These, these giant big projects, like the train, like you know, these big things, that's not where people are. They're focused on local communities, on things that can be achieved locally, that they're, they can see the results, and they're willing to put money behind it, whether in schools or libraries or anything. That's been a, a real shift over the past 10 years, and we ought to take advantage of it with this water bond. Thank you, Senator. So um, there's some, a number of questions here about how do we find that right balance between environment and human use and in some cases, even between environmental uses and environmental benefits. And, and so Supervisor Provenza um, and Jay, the, the, um, take us a little bit deeper in the struggle we're in here in terms of the Delta in particular and, and the ability to both use the Yolo Basin to provide agriculture, to provide the wildlife refuges, and potentially to help restore the, the fisheries, which not only are fish, but are, in the case of the salmon, are an industry of themselves. So, Give us another, obviously this is a very sophisticated audience and they want to know a little bit more about how we're going to go about balancing those uh, in the details. Okay. 
Uh, I, I think uh, it's really important uh, to, to recognize that uh, those interests can be balanced, but that uh, the, the trick is getting people to work together. Uh, for example, with, uh, with uh, agriculture and uh, fish projects in, in the uh, uh, Yolo uh, uh, Causeway, in the uh, 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 areas where there's agriculture, you have to, you have to uh, figure out a way to have both work at the same time. And one of the things that we found was that you, if you're paying attention just to how many acres, like a, we want so many acres for a habitat project, that's not a very good approach because those acres are currently uh, being used for agriculture. But if you ask, okay, how can we, how can we use uh, that same land for both? And as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you, you can do all the flooding you want uh, earlier in the year with significant benefit for uh, federal uh, endangered fish species. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, show that uh, the damage to agriculture is minimized. Well, so what about after that? What if you want to address environmental needs or fish needs after that point? Then you talk about, well, let's, let's figure out where we put the water at that point. Can, can we direct the water uh, to, to certain locations, not just flood, say, 17,000 acres or flood uh, too large of an area? Uh, can we look at other areas other than those areas that have been identified? Uh, one of the things that we're trying to look at now is uh, in the flood control efforts, uh, they are looking at uh, uh, the possibility of actually expanding the bypass uh, in the uh, Elkhorn area uh, by widening the Fremont Weir, which would actually put more water north of I-5. Now that would impact uh, agriculture, but at the same time, we might be able to provide some flood benefits in Yolo County that would make it very much worthwhile both to agriculture and to our population. And we're, we're at the very beginnings of looking at that. Is there a mutual, mutual beneficial project? Could we then move the footprint uh, for the fish project to that area, or, or part of the footprint to that area, and, and lessen uh, le the, the impact on agriculture, and then gain a, a, a benefit not only for, for uh, a species, but for uh, flood protection. Mm -hmm. And is there a win-win or a net gain for Yolo County in that? And we think if everybody is willing to sit down and work together towards that goal, that's very possible. Excellent. Jay, some thoughts? Yes. So picking up where Jim left off, which I think is critical, is that we actually have shared goals here. And I, I, I think uh, the Nature Conservancy approaches these kinds of challenges in the, through the lens of, can we make this work from a restoration ecology, from a scientific perspective, in balancing environmental needs and needs of people? And I think the first thing we've got to do is back to what I initially talked about, is better rationalizing California's water balance. How much water can we actually afford to export out of the delta and under what conditions? And I think that's really the heart of the question that we need to figure out around the Bay Delta Conservation Plan. Stepping back from that just a bit, I think that we also need to figure out, can, in, in rationalizing our needs, can we find a way to protect those environmental values that we care about in the delta, which include agriculture, which include uh, the Delta as, as a regional resource for California. Can we also address one of the issues that Tim talked about earlier, the conversion of land types so that we're thinking about making the valley a place that is hospitable uh, for migratory birds and that we're not crowding out every uh, place of, uh, that is valuable uh, for habitat with uh, orchards and proliferation of vineyards. And so we've got to have a much bigger conversation here about whether we can get to shared goals and then applying the best science we can and recognizing that we've got to have an adaptive process that has real understandings about, one, not increasing uh, exports of water from the Delta South. And we've got to reconcile, as Senator Wolk noted earlier, We've got to reconcile that we can only support so much agriculture uh, in the San Joaquin Valley. So some land has got to be taken out of production in the San Joaquin Valley in order to make this work. And we're probably going to have to have more storage, certainly more below ground storage, 
uh, in all likelihood, additional above ground storage where it makes sense and where it uh, passes the cost benefit test in order to balance all those values out. And these are tough things for me to say as an environmental advocate, but we've all got to kind of give something up in order to make it work. And do you want to add anything in particular around reconciliation ecology? Uh, I would say the definition of reconciliation ecology is in the eye of the beholder and where you stand on a particular issue. So, uh, and, and I think the best example of, of reconciliation ecology is uh, the state and federal wildlife refuge system, which uh, actually was established as mitigation for the impacts of the Central Valley project and recognizing that that was going to dry up what used to be uh, just a hundred years ago, wetland habitat that proliferated through the Central Valley. And so that is an experiment that is a continuing work in progress. And uh, as Tim noted earlier, our refuges are being shorted water at a dramatic rate uh, in a year in which paradoxically at the northern end of the flyway, we're expecting an extraordinarily uh, beneficial summer uh, for migratory birds to which they will come back south and find 30% of the wetland habitat that they saw three years ago available uh, for food and nesting. And that can create, uh, ex just that will stress the flyway system at an, ex at an exorbitant level, really presenting a great likelihood of avian uh, flu and, and cholera epi epidemics that we have never seen before. And so these are really serious issues that we have to, we can't take those public resources that are the heart of reconciliation economy, re reconciliation ecology, and put them on an altar of the economy um, and pretend that if we short these resources, they'll continue to be there, because they, they, they will not. They require our continued investment over time. Same root word, though, oikos, yes. right? <laughs> uh, Latin for home. So there's a number of questions in here around the economics of all of this. And, and of course, um, all of the long-term projects we've talked about will require some additional investment. Uh, there's also the short-term or localized uh, economic impacts, including the ones around the BDCP. But for the folks out there, in a very pragmatic standpoint, uh, whether you're a farmer in the Olo County Flood Control and Water Conservation District or you're in a city, uh, in the short term, you're going to be asked to pay more for less. Um, and, uh, and, and what's the what's the best way for the public to understand the importance of investing in this water system and recognizing that there are times when we're going to actually pay more for less? You can all jump at that right away. <laughs> or we can... Uh, let, well, let me up. let me open it up by by saying uh, in our district in every district in every situation is uh, different but uh, but we we make our money we stay in business we support uh, ecology programs as well as our infrastructure programs by water sales and we're going to have zero water sales this year uh, from releases from storage so we're expecting 80 percent of our budget to take a hit that's uh, that's going to impact our ability. I talked with the State Water Resource Control Board the other day in a drought hearing about, uh, you know, they're asking what could they do, the state do to help out. I said, you know, some of these, if these programs of groundwater monitoring are important to you, figure out a way to help us uh, sustain these through, through the drought period. Longer term, it's going to require the district to take a hard look at how we structure our rates uh, schedule and have conversations with our, or our water customers about uh, water availability charges, groundwater recharge mm -hmm. charges. You know, there's any number of vehicles, and it's not going to be easy. There's Prop 218 that, uh, you know, is a barrier. Um, but, uh, but we're expecting an immediate impact to our deals. Unfortunately, our farmers, I think, this year would be happy to pay more for, for less, but they, they're not going to pay anything for nothing. So. <laughs> <laughs> any other perspectives on that? I think um, <clears throat> just <clears throat> from a 30,000-foot level, uh, one of the problems, I think, and in California and in the West is that what we are paying for water, the cost of the water doesn't really reflect um, its real value um, or what it costs to provide it. Um, if, if the price were more reflective of its value, uh, you wouldn't have the kinds of crazy decisions that you have in the West, for the Westlands Water District, the west side of the South Central Valley which is putting in year-round crops when they are junior water rights holders and don't get, cannot expect to have water all year round. That's 
not realistic. But the price of the water is so cheap that those kinds of decisions can be made. And then there are a number of other reasons why. But there needs to be a, a better um, rational um, pricing of water so that it truly reflects its value and, its, and, its, and the societal cost of providing it. Uh, and that will mean, in my view, that the cost of water will increase. So it sounds like one of the uh, challenging conversations for the um, coming year is to, is to reconcile groundwater and surface water management and how to put in, uh, make some progress on reforms on that. And one of the ones with the public is going to be the value of uh, water and the waterscape and how we're going to do uh, good investment and stewardship of our resources. We have maybe one final question that we can answer on and, and maybe give everyone on the panel a, a, a shot at, uh, at a minute or so of answering. How will we as citizens of Yolo County uh, be educated on policy, and, and what can we do to stay involved? What is it, uh, what's the, if this is that time where people are paying attention, what do we want them paying attention to, and how can they contribute to a, a better solution in years ahead? Ken, you wanna start? And then we'll go right down to David and. Okay, uh, you know, again, I'm a, the plumber here, the nuts and bolts guy. <laughs> uh, and there's a wonderful organization called the Water Resource Association, Association of Yolo County. It's an umbrella organization, and it, it in and of itself doesn't have any authority or power, but it, it brings all the water players together and talks about the issues and, and helps develop strategy. We have a technical committee that meets once a month and a, and a board of directors that meets quarterly. Uh, that's one way to stay involved at a very local level, very nuts and bolts. Obviously, if you're a citizen of Davis or, or Woodland, you have plenty of opportunity, uh, have had over the last couple of years, to engage on th those issues. But, uh, um, but that's where I'd leave it, Jim. I don't have much to add. I guess I would just say that, you know, kind of from somebody who looks at Yolo County from a valley-wide perspective, I think you have a wonderful governance uh, structure here in Yolo County that I don't see in a lot of other places with many of the layers that Tim referred to. You obviously have a, a board of supervisors, uh, the members of which are very engaged in this issue um, and I think are, are leaders in this area. You have the WRA, you have the Yolo County Flood Control District, you have your city councils. And so to me, I think in Yolo County, you have, I think, an incredibly representative government um, with respect to water supplies, and I just think that staying engaged in that and whichever level you are most comfortable, I think, is, uh, is very positive. We haven't talked much about the BDCP, which is out there, and the tunnel proposal. I think that in addition to everything that was said um, just now, I think uh, there are many organizations that really could use um, the activism and the energy of Yolo County and of Yolo County citizens. Um, thinking of Restore the Delta in particular, there's a lot, uh, you know, the Delta does not have the same political power that the rest of the state has. And it's really important um, to get involved in these issues, uh, particularly about the BDCP. Um, the pa and I was very amused when you, when you mentioned reconciliation um, ecology. The fact is that you can't sit around the table if you have a real disparity of power. And that's what this is about. Um, we really do need to unify. Um, Jim and the Delta counties have done a tremendous job in working together, in cooperating, and it's made a real difference in terms of what Yolo County has been able to achieve and I hope will be able to achieve uh, within that process. But it really requires the citizens, um, you all, to get involved. And there are plenty of organizations. The League of Women Voters is very active in the Delta communities. Uh, I would encourage you to um, get involved. This will affect our region in a major way, a major way. Well, I, I concur with that. I, well, I think in Davis, we really do set an example for other communities. Our water usage compared to uh, other communities in the area is already quite a bit lower, and, and we're, we're uh, I think, uh, going to 
going to be another 20 percent below that. So we set an example in terms of our uh, approach to the environment and our approach to conservation. But I, I, I think the second part of that that uh, uh, Senator Wolk alluded to is, is actually being actively engaged in these issues uh, that affect us in the region and the state. Because it is, to a certain extent, about power, who has it and who doesn't. Uh, and, and the more active citizens are, more informed you are, uh, the more we'll be able to accomplish. So I, I would encourage everybody to participate in forums like this and, and educate yourself on the issues and continue to, to work hard on it. Bring this home to an area that Yolo County has really been a state leader on thanks to uh, Tim's leadership and, and, uh, and the investment of the agricultural community working together um, in balancing um, management of, of uh, groundwater resources with n with ongoing needs and recognizing the need for uh, creative um, storage of that water so that it's there in drought times like this and 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 I just want to underscore the benefits of this that, that in this county we can set a new paradigm for California policy in this area and I would encourage residents of the county to actively participate in this debate in the capital um, yeah, it really is about having a sustainable water resource uh, for future generations. It is about water quality, both for the environment and for people. It is about keeping saltwater intrusion out of our aquifers. Uh, it is about providing opportunities to creatively store water and recharge aquifers so that we continue to have perennial streams um, flowing around us and the wildlife that depend on that resource. And so. I think there's, there's really something special here, um, and we need to kind of bottle that up uh, and take it to Sacramento and, and really help people understand the value of, of sustainable groundwater management. Uh, so in summary, I think this is going to be a very hot, dry, painful year with a lot of dislocation in certain parts of the state, harm and challenges. And, but what you hear from this panel is a commitment to creativity, uh, to collaboration, to developing integrated solutions that have multiple benefits that can be measured by a triple bottom line. Um, and Yolo County has a chance uh, not just to follow but to lead and to continue to lead on this issue. So with that, I'm going to pass it off uh, to Don Saylor, who's going to give us our closing remarks and thank yous. Thank you. Let's give these folks a round of applause. I think that uh, Mr. Guy is almost a YOLO one, do you think? He's almost got the YOLO way down. At least he, can t he knows it when he sees it, and that's a, that's a good step. He's ready. He's, he's ready. So, you know, Jim Mayer always does a wonderful job of facilitation, and, and he did it, did, did it again tonight. And these, these folks are really knowledgeable individuals in this topic, and no place else in the state would you find this kind of a group gathered together just for the purpose of sharing with, what, with uh, this wonderful community. This, uh, this group didn't just happen upon the scene here. We have, if you look around, four people who are volunteers working for the Davis Media Access. And you, you'll notice that they have four cameras and they've been doing the sound all night. This is going to be broadcast on Channel 15 probably in about a week's time or so give or take, uh, and it, it's at two weeks time, and at the same time it'll be available online on, on, the, on the DMA website, Davis Media Access, as well as on Saving California Communities website. So you can access both of them just by Googling those, those phrases, Davis Media Access or Saving California Communities. But we do have some costs associated with the production of the video, and we ask if you are willing and interested there's a little collection plate back there, and Lucas, Lucas Frerichs is holding it. If you turn back, you'll see he's right back there with a big smile and a jar of, jar of cash. I'm not sure if they're connected, but that's what's going on. This, uh, I'm so delighted to, to be able to a part of Saving California Communities, and several of the other people who are a part of that core group are here this evening. This is Davis Campbell, who is a former member of the Yolo County Board of Education. Susan Lovenberg, who is a member of the Davis Board of Education, and Lucas Frerich who, is a, Frerichs, who is a member of the Davis City Council. But many of you who are here now have been actively participating in the, in the Saving California Community Series for some time. And you know, right, Michael, so you, you know that this is not just the first and it's not the last. As you look at that Saving California Communities website, 
please, if you have some issues that you think would be would benefit from this kind of a discussion, or if you'd like to engage further, just sign up online. We have uh, email addresses for a good number of you. If you'd like to leave your email address, if you haven't done so yet, then we'll be sure and include you on the list when the next kind next things come out. I want to share this. I want to commend this document to you, the one that that uh, David Guy referred to at the beginning. This is put together by the the uh, Northern California Water Alliance. That alliance is is a consortium of ver of several different organizations: Valley Vision, SACOG, uh, Northern California Water Association. I'm leaving somebody out. I'm not sure. Metro Chamber. The Metro Metro Chamber. Okay, so several, several, and what we've we've come together to really take a look at how these, how the issues affecting us all in water policy and in water reality this year and then in the time to come, uh, how they play out. Because it's a, as you heard tonight, it's a complicated set of issues. So one of the one template that you've got, this is like a Rosetta Stone. It's meant to be your decoder ring on water issues. <laughs> So if you look down one side, you see the issues. Uh, here are the issues, drought, BDCP, biological opinion. And then across, you'll see the timeline for when, things are, when key decisions are being made. And what you're going to see there is that 2014 is a pretty big year. There are some major issues that are coming up in 2014. But they don't just stop there. They go on for quite a while. And you see also this array of impacts across this side on, the, on this centerfold. You see this, this array of impacts. And the blue dot shows which of these different issues uh, result in an impact in one of those categories. This is, this is a very significant set of issues for all of us. You've heard tonight. And this, the idea of this one is to give you a sense of where, where you find more information and how these issues interplay. On the back page are, is an identification of the key organizations and individuals who will be engaged in these issues over this next, this next set of years. Uh, this 2014, again, is a very big year. Not everybody received a copy of this document, if, uh, but if you put your, we will, we'll, you can get it on the website of the North State Water Organization. Is that right, David? Yeah. Okay, so you can, northstatewater.org. Northstatewater you can get, you can access this same information and again, give us, give us your, your email and, and we'll, we'll go ahead. Uh, let's see. I think, should we introduce each other and go through a welcoming? No, we'll, 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 we'll stop for now. Uh, thank you very much. Susan, is there anything further that we should say? Thank you for coming, everybody. And we'll see you, uh, see you soon. Bye-bye.